Hi, I'm Becca Thompson. I came to Shepherd 13 or 14 years ago when I was invited by a friend to bring my kids to Big Story Live on Wednesday nights. We already had a church we went to, so we really weren't interested in changing churches, um, but we wanted to come and have fun with some friends. My kids loved uh, Dale Shoemaker and Steve Crawford's shenanigans, and eventually we started coming on a Sunday. Um, we decided that this probably was a church for us and it's where we belonged. We were made to feel included even though we weren't looking for a church. Church helped me to raise my kids. The church was there and supported me when my mom was going through cancer treatments. Um, it, it's always been there for me and been my community. I feel like the church has really invested in me, so that makes me feel compelled to invest back into the church. Hey there. We're Scott and Sally Swick, and we got asked to talk a little bit about how we are investing in Shepherd of the Hills. And investing is kind of an interesting word. You know, when you invest in something, you expect a return. And Jesus talked a little bit about this in Luke 6. He said, give, and it will be given back to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, they'll pour in your lap for whatever measure you deal out to others, it will be dealt to you in return. Well, Jesus wasn't just talking about money. He was talking about how we invest our time, our talents, and our treasures. Uh, for example, if I am volunteering, investing my time at Williams Elementary School, being a mentor to a little, who will be a fifth grader this year, it is uh, most important to just simply show up and, and love these little kids and be a constant person in their lives that they can trust to show up every week. It's been a wonderful experience and I've had tremendous support from Sue and people at the church with resources and ideas whenever I'm anxious to find something new and exciting to share with my little guy. Uh, moving on to not only time, but talent as well. Scott loves to teach. I think that some of you, I'm sure some of you have participated in his classes at Shepherd. And there will be more to come, I'm sure, because that is his passion and he is very good at it. But we all have our gifts and there are so many great opportunities at Shepherd to find a spot that fits each of us. So on top of that is also the treasures, so time, talent, and treasures. And Jesus, you know, Leon keeps reminding us every week about what the Apostle Paul said, and that is that we should decide in advance what we should give so that we're never doing it out of obligation or with any sort of reluctance. So one of the things that we did was we had our financial advisor set up a donor-advised fund. And there we decide each year how much we're gonna put into it, how, uh, how we're going to fund it, and then uh, we then decide how much we're gonna send it overseas, how much is gonna go stay in the United States, what mission organizations we wanna be involved with, and most importantly to us is our investment in Shepherd of the Hills. So that's, uh, that's the third example. We're all in, we're investing in Shepherd of the Hills, and we hope you do too. So this is um, uh, the culmination of the sermon series that we've been working on for the past several weeks entitled I'm All In. Uh, and uh, this series has helped us to learn how we can live an all-in kind of life as we seek to follow Jesus together. And uh, at the end of this particular sermon today, we're going to offer an opportunity to everybody uh, that's gathered here, and if you're online as well, uh, to find a way to go all in when it comes to your involvement and investment of your time and your talent. Uh, so there's going to be tables that will be set up in the narthex and other places as well uh, where you can go and you can visit some of these areas uh, that maybe you haven't even thought of before of ways that you can get involved uh, and that you can invest your time and your talent to serve this family of faith, to serve our community. Uh, so there's going to be great opportunities for you to do that. And uh, I'll talk a little bit more about that at the end of the sermon. And uh, for those of you who are online, all you need to do if you are interested in finding a place to serve uh, is to just email us. So email church at shpc.org uh, and we will help you figure that out. We'll help you find uh, a place where you can serve even if you're not here in Austin. Uh, there's great ways that you can serve even if you're uh, watching and worshiping with us long distance. 
Um, but next Sunday is also a piece of this, right? So uh, next Sunday, we're going to be talking about what it means to invest our financial commitments. Uh, and we're going to be encouraging uh, each and every one of our members and friends uh, to make a financial commitment uh, and uh, to pledge your support for the life of this church. So that's going to happen next Sunday on Commitment Sunday. Uh, and uh, that'll, be, that'll be very exciting uh, for us as a family of faith as we chart a new way forward into a world that has changed, but we're also leaving a lot of stuff behind us, right? And honestly, good riddance. Um, I mean, come on, man. You know, it is time. Uh, let's just, you know, those, the past couple of years were the past couple of years. Uh, and I'm excited about what God is doing in the life of this family of faith. Um, and I'm excited about the future. Uh, in fact, I don't think I've been more excited uh, in, in, in terms of just like what's happening around us, the opportunities that we have as a family of faith, how we are uniquely positioned as a church where we are in order to do amazing things. And so I'm excited about what God has in store for us. And today, we're going we're gonna to tie up that sermon series that we've been working on because we've been talking about what it means to be all in uh, in our family of faith. And we've identified four areas that we really need to just embrace. If we're going to be all in when it comes to being part of this family of faith, being a light in our community, being the kind of church that loves God and loves everybody, both here in Austin and around the world, but also, also, what it means to be all in on our own faith journey. And so these four things are super important. What it means to be invited, included, involved, and invested. And over the course of this series, we've learned what it means to be all in in terms of invited, right? That we not only feel invited, but that we also invite. The things that matter to us, we wanna share. And so we're all in when we invite others to join us in the joy that we find in following Jesus. And we also learned what it means to be included. And we're all in when we both welcome and include. It's not enough just to welcome people, right? We have to both welcome and include. As we are in included in the family of God, we need to do the same to others. And last week we learned what it meant to be involved. We're all in when our involvement comes from an abundant life rather than a life lived in scarcity. And so we talked about the whole busyness thing and how sometimes that can be a trap for us, uh, right? And so when we live an abundant life, we find all of the space then to be involved in things that matter, things that are eternal. So today we're going to learn what it means to be invested, to be invested. Uh, and, you know, basically the big idea, one of the big ideas that we're going to be talking about is actually something that's uh, kind of smart, um, that I did not come up with. Uh, so it's this something, I can say it's smart because it wasn't me that said it, right? <laughs> so this is what we're gonna be doing today. It's all about intentions. In fact, we're gonna be uh, taking a look at a passage of scripture that is gonna really highlight that. It's all about intentions and how when they don't match our actions, things can go wrong for us in a lot of different ways. Years ago, Pastor Andy Stanley, uh, who, who I admire and who's done some great work, he wrote a book that was really impactful to me. It was called Principle of the Path. And in that book, Andy Stanley said this, your direction, it's your direction, not your intention, that determines your destination. Now, years ago, I preached a whole sermon series on this um, that somebody, I was talking to somebody earlier, actually remembered. And I was like, oh my gosh, uh, someone remembered that I had preached on this. Um, but I'm not preaching on the principle of the path per se today, but it really was, it was something that loomed large when I was thinking about this particular sermon and about what it means to be invested and when our intentions right? When they're matching up with our actions, that really does determine where we're heading. And so that's what Andy Stanley was saying. Basically, I mean, it's a simple proposition. No matter what your intentions might be, no matter what you, know, you state your intentions might be, right? I want to go there. I want to be that kind of person. I want to accomplish this, right? 
All those things matter very little if the direction that you step off into and the direction that you're heading leads you somewhere else, right? Because it's the direction, not your intention, that determines where you're gonna end up. I mean, it's simple geometry, right? If you start off in LAX airport in Los Angeles and your destination, your intended destination is New York City, uh, if the pilot uh, accidentally changes the instrument so that you're 3.5 degrees to the south of where you're really supposed to be going, then you're gonna end up in Washington, D.C. And nobody wants to go there, right? <laughs> <laughs> Except to sightsee and, you know, see if you can, you know, find out national treasure if it really is true, right? So, I mean, so LAX to New York, 3.5 degrees to the south, and you're going to end up in Washington, D.C., right? So that, that's just, you know, it's like a, an image of like how that can work, right? So no matter what you say, no matter what your intentions are, all are in good intentions, even the ones that we might not even, we might not even be aware of, right? The things that we state, all those intentions will play second fiddle to our actions, if we step off in the wrong direction. And so the passage of scripture that I'm gonna be preaching from today <laughs> is one that I've always wanted to preach on around the season of stewardship, okay? And you're gonna see why in just a little bit. It's, for those of you who have, you know, kind of a little bit familiar with the book of Acts, this is the story of Ananias and Sapphira. Uh, this is a story of people um, who didn't give everything to the church and God struck them dead. <laughs> 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 I was like, I was like, this is too good to pass up, right? So I'm preaching from this particular sermon or this particular passage because, uh, <laughs> because it speaks directly into what I'm saying about intentions and direction. But it also <laughs> happens to be like the one sermon that as a pastor you should never preach on uh, during stewardship. And I was like, I don't care. I'm going to do it, right? Let's do it. And so it speaks directly into the main point uh, that uh, I want to hold on to today. So this is the big idea uh, that I want to hold on to. We're all in when our best intentions are equal to our actions, right? Okay, so our story actually uh, doesn't begin in Acts chapter 5, verses 1 through 11, which is the story of Ananias and Sapphira. It actually begins in Acts chapter 4. And so you've, you've got this whole sort of unfolding uh, in the first couple of chapters of Acts of uh, how the church is formed and this amazing stuff that's going on uh, and how they're living together uh, in this sort of community where they're sharing things and people are just, you know, getting blown up by the power of the Holy Spirit as amazing things are going on. And so in Acts chapter four, we have this little snippet that leads into chapter five. All the believers were one and heart and mind. Uh, <laughs> then you, if you keep reading the story by Acts 20, uh, they're not of one heart and mind. Uh, they're fighting over all kinds of stuff. And so what happens when you start forming committees and you know, all the things. But like at the beginning, everybody was happy. No one claimed that any of their possessions was their own, but they shared everything they had. With great power, the apostles continued to testify to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And God's grace was so powerfully at work in them all that there were no needy persons among them. For from time to time, those who owned land or houses sold them, brought the money from the sales and put it at the apostles' feet and it was distributed to anyone who had need. Joseph, a Levite from Cyprus, whom the apostles called Barnabas, which means son of encouragement, sold a field he owned and brought the money and put it at the apostles' feet. So that's the end of chapter four. Now we move on to Acts chapter five, verses one through 11. And this is what we get. Now, a man named Ananias, together with his wife Sapphira, also sold a piece of property. With his wife's full knowledge, he kept back part of the money for himself, but brought the rest and put it at the apostles' feet. Then Peter said, Ananias, how is it that Satan has so filled your heart that you have lied to the Holy Spirit and have kept your, for yourself some of the money you received for the land? 
Didn't it belong to you before it was sold? And after it was sold, wasn't the money at your disposal? What made you think of doing such a thing? You have not lied just to human beings, but to God. When Ananias heard this, he fell down and died. <laughs> Amen. Let's go home. <laughs> and great fear seized all who heard what had happened. Then some young men came forward, wrapped up his body, and carried him out and buried him. About three hours later, his wife came in, not knowing what had happened. Peter asked her, tell me, is this the price you and Ananias got for the land? Yes, she said, that is the price. Peter said to her, how could you conspire to test the spirit of the Lord? Listen, the feet of the men who buried your husband are at the door, and they will carry you out also. At that moment, she fell down at his feet and died. Then the young, <laughs> then the young man came in. I know, it's a great story, isn't it? <laughs> I have saved, I have been preaching for 20 something years and I have never preached on this passage of scripture. <laughs> and I've always wanted to do it. Then the young, came in and fa young man came in and finding her dead, carried her out and buried her beside her husband. Great fear seized the whole church and all who heard about these events, as you might imagine. So I've got a little artist representation here that uh, was from like the 17th century. Uh, so this is Ananias falling dead. Uh, and, uh, you know, people all seized with fear. Um, and, uh, you know, so this, was, this has been a sort of an imaginative sort of story in the history of the church and you know, this cultural imagination. It's also a passage that doesn't get preached on all that often. Um, I think I remember hearing a sermon in the churches that I grew up in. I did hear a sermon once. Uh, it wasn't by the pastor of the church. He, like, brought in a guy to preach a revival, and the guy preached on this passage and then did a whole thing with it. It was amazing. I mean, I think the offerings that night were really good. Um, so... <laughs> But at any rate, um, there's, there's a, in some of the translations, what you get uh, instead of now is you get the word but, uh, because what's happening is uh, Luke, who's writing uh, this particular account of the Acts of the Apostles, uh, Luke uh, begins with the word but, because everything that happened before then is in contrast to what's about to happen, right? Uh, so you get this contrast. Now here's a big question for a lot of us, right? Did this actually happen? You know, because there are some folks who would be like, well, yes, of course, it's in the Bible. That's what the Bible says, right? And then there's other people that would be like, I don't really like this. This, this isn't, I, I don't think I've ever heard this story. I'm not sure what you're trying to say here, you know? And, and, it, and there's a struggle, right? Because a lot of people will say, and I've heard this so many times, um, they're like, I don't like the God of the Old Testament. Because the God of the Old Testament strikes people dead. You know, it makes people kill other people. I don't like the God of the Old Testament, but I like the God of the New Testament. Well, guess what? This story's from the New Testament. And I hate to break it to you, but the God that we're talking about, even from the Old Testament, is the same God. It's the same God. You know, but people's understanding and perceptions of God have changed a tad by the time you get to the New Testament, but still, there's this story that is difficult for us to put our heads around. And so asking whether or not this happened, because there's, there's obviously some, some problems with the text, right, as you start to kind of see how some of this transpires. So rather than asking that question, and rather than getting in the weeds about that, that's the wrong question to ask. What we need to be asking is this. What did it mean for the church? Because it's obvious that something happened, right? Something that wasn't good for these two people. So you can get all wound up in trying to figure out what the facts are and miss the truth, right? And so the truth of the matter is that something happened and, and there's something else, right? Because Luke, who's writing the book of Acts, is writing it with something in mind, right? Luke began to see as he followed around the apostles, as he listened, as he interviewed people, as Luke interviewed people like Mary. You know, we know that that's what he did. He interviewed people like Mary because there's conversations that he had with Mary that none of the other gospel uh, writers have. All right, and so Luke dug, he, and he also saw patterns. And one of the patterns that Luke saw was that the story of the church was in a way a retelling of the story of Israel that began with Pentecost. 
So on the day of Pentecost, when all of the people are gathered together after Jesus has been uh, transfigured or, or ascended, right? So Jesus is raised from the dead, ascends, which means he just goes into a different reality um, and is now gone from them physically. They're waiting and then Pentecost comes and there's this amazing day when the spirit falls upon the church and transforms everything. Well, the day of Pentecost was also in the Jewish tradition, the Feast of Shavuot, which was the day that Moses received the law from God on Mount Sinai. And so there's a new law that has been given to human beings, right? A new way of now being able to relate to God through Jesus, right? And so there's this, this new law, this new sort of community. And so there's a pattern that begins to follow. So Luke connects the dots as he's going and he's making these connections. And this story for Luke, as he heard this story, it made, it, it rang true to him, right, in a way that, that was interesting because he connects this, and, it, and it's, you don't see it on the surface, but when you see what Luke is doing as a whole, you start to realize that there's a story in the book of Joshua, Joshua chapter 7, that connects to this very story of Ananias and Sapphira. The story in Joshua chapter 7 is the story of Achan, or Achan, uh, and this is a guy who, after the fall of Jericho, when the people of Israel are told, don't take anything from the Jericho, like from Jericho, don't take any of the goods and the, and the, the coins and the jewels and the, and the clothing and all that. Don't take any of the spoils of war because they belong to the community. They belong to everyone. They belong to God, which means they belong to everyone, right? And so Achan, or Achan, takes something, right? He takes some of what he finds in, in the, the, the rubble of, Jer of Jericho, and then he hides it. And so then calamity falls the community, right? Because the next place that they go uh, to conquer, right, is they're going through and conquering all these uh, towns and these tribal, uh, uh, tribal peoples. Uh, they get defeated, and they lose a bunch of people. And they don't know why. Like, how did this happen? Well, it's revealed that Akan had done this, right? And so in this story, Akan and all of his family and his belongings and his tents and his, his livestock and everything are swallowed up by the earth. It's a pretty terrible ending for Akan. Um, and I think that this is what Luke is doing. He connects the dots between Joshua 7 and this story, right? Because he sees it as this is something that happens where somebody withholds from the community and the community suffers. But here's what we need to know, that this story was widely told. And so people heard this story. People knew this story. It was part of the church part of what they were telling one another about what had happened to these people. It was obviously a terrible thing what happened to them, right? But why did it happen? What did they do? Well, what they did um, was their intentions did not ma match their actions, right? So their stated intention was to give, like Barnabas, to give money from a sale of a property to the church. And they led the church, they led the people to believe that they were giving all of it when in fact they weren't. And even Peter says, you could have just told us, right, that you were only giving some of it. But you made it look as though you were giving all of it. You were trying to, to look like this other guy. Your intentions, your stated intentions were this, but your actions led you somewhere else, right? And so this is the lesson that we learn from this, right? Is that when we do this, right, it ends up leading us to places that we don't want to be. It can end up leading us to our own destruction. And when it comes to our life of faith, when it comes to being part of a community, the ways that we withhold our time and our talent and our treasure, the ways that we, we want to, to hang on to it, right? Because we don't have enough and we've struggled to be, you know, like we talked about last week, we struggle because of our busyness, we struggle because of this, we struggle because we're living in scarcity, all the rest of it, right? So we withhold these things, we withhold the best from our community, from our family, from even from ourselves. And so Ananias and Sapphira did this and it resulted in destruction. Their intentions 
and their actions did not match up. So what do we learn from this? Well, we learn that God is not satisfied with cursory symbolic gestures. God wants our inside to match our outside, both acting as an expression of our generosity. And so these symbolic gestures that Ananias and Sapphira had, right, they were wanting everybody to believe that they were something they weren't, that they were pious and generous and all the rest of it. I think a lot of us want to believe that about ourselves, right, with the way that we live and move in the world. We want to believe the best about ourselves. You know, we want to believe that we're the kinds of people that would do good things, that would do good in the world, that we would be awesome, Right? And so our intentions that we set out into the world are to be those people. That's what we want to believe. That I can be a better person. I can be generous. I can be a force for good in the world. I can be involved and invested. But then what happens to us is the first step that we take is often not in that direction. <laughs> So how do we figure this out? Like how, as a community of faith, how do we do this as individuals? Well, for me, there's two questions that come to mind that I think are very important for us to be asking as we consider what it means to really and truly have our inside meet, match our outside, have our intentions and our actions be congruent, to be the kinds of people that will be invested in our life of faith, in our communities of faith, in the things that matter most. And these two questions are very simple, one of which you've probably heard me say or, or ask before, right? And the first one is this. What can I possibly give to the one who has given me everything? How grateful are you really? I mean, that's what it comes down to. Like, we all need to ask ourselves that. I mean, how grateful am I really for everything that has been given and done for me? You know, if your question is, what does the church need, or what does my community of faith need, or what does my family need, or what, you know, if that's the question that you're asking to drive your investment of your time and your talent and your treasure, it's the wrong question, because that is going to lead you in a direction that you don't want to go. Because if it's out of duty, if it's out of compulsion, if it's out of some need you know, to, to be seen as a better person, then that's not a direction that's gonna lead you to where you want to be. That's the first step off in a direction that will lead you maybe even to your own destruction. But the question that you ask when you say, what can I possibly give to the one who has given me everything? That's a deeper question because that has to do with gratitude. That has to do with the response of like, you know, the answer to that might be everything that I am. But what does that look like, right, in the end? Well, that should lead us to this question, the next one, which is how can my best intentions be expressed by my actions? How then should I live? How then should I make this part of my life? Because if you're answering the question, what could I possibly give to the one who has given me everything? The response can only be everything in return, right? All of who I am, all that I have, all of my time and my talent and treasure belong to God and so I can give it back to God and not worry then about any return on my investment, right? Because God, We'll take care of that part. My intentions, though, need to be based on that gratitude and that gratitude alone and the humility that comes with it, right? To just simply have my intentions set to be the best person that I could possibly be in the eyes of God, to know that I am loved and cherished and that no matter how often I stumble and fall, that I praise God ought to be stumbling in the right direction, right? And if my intentions are set toward that with the right reasons, then my actions should follow. All of the things that you do then should follow those intentions. It doesn't matter what you say, it matters what you do. It doesn't matter where you say you wanna go, if your feet are leading you in the wrong direction, you're not gonna get where you want to go. And so therefore, that first step is vital and it needs to be a good one for every single one of us. Every single one of us needs to have that first good 
step. Because if we take that first good step, then it's going to lead us where our intentions and our desires and our longing wants to go. Because that longing and that intention that you have to make the world a better place, to be a better person, to be more generous, to be more giving, to be more of everything that you long to be, that comes not from any place that has to do with you. That comes from the image of God that is within you, the longing, the DNA of the divine, a divine who longs for you to join God and God's great work of redeeming, restoring, and rescuing the world. And so today, you have an opportunity as you leave this place, as you walk out these doors, you have an opportunity to to step into something different because your direction is going to determine your destination. And so if your direction is, is needing some help, well, guess what? We can help. We can help. And there's all kinds of ways that you can do that. And so as you leave today and as you walk out, I want to encourage you to find a place to get involved and to get invested. We have unbelievable mission opportunities where you, you don't have to go all the way across the world. You can just be right here in your own backyard. But if you want to go all the way across the world, we have opportunities for that as well. There's all kinds of ways for you to serve in mission, both locally and globally. There's all kinds of ways that you can donate, that you can give to help those who are in need. There are all kinds of mission opportunities and ministry opportunities in our church. And you say, well, I don't have a lot of, I'm not very creative. I can't do this or I can't do that. Well, what is it that you can do? Can you trim rose bushes? Can you stand at the front of the church and just say hello to people? I mean, there's like so many things that you could be doing to take, just to make one little difference in the life of someone. And you have no idea how it could change someone's life. Just having a friendly face that greets them at the front of the church when they're coming for the first time and you have no idea what's going on in their life and maybe, just maybe, they were looking for a family of faith where they could feel welcomed and included and they've been feeling broken and messed up and they've been angry at God or whatever it is and that one moment could change their life. Because you know how I know this? Because I've heard stories like that from some of you who have been part of this church for a long time. Someone took a step in the right direction and it transformed you. So why not do the same? And so I would encourage us as a family of faith, let this be the day when we really and truly, if you haven't already, find a place to get involved and invested. And we're gonna have opportunities available for you know, a long time, so you know, just think about it. If you wanna pray about it, then do so today. Uh, and I want us to remember this. I mean, this is the one big idea that I wanted us to hold on to. And if you don't remember anything else that I said today, if you remember this, then I will be extraordinarily happy as your pastor. We're all in when our best intentions are equal to our actions. Hallelujah. Amen. Let us pray. Good and gracious God, we are grateful and humbled to be able to gather here today, both in person, online, all of who have gathered today, God, I pray that you would just cover them in your grace and peace. Cover each and every one of us with the power of your spirit. Lord, I pray that you would guide us to where we should go, to be involved and invested in our life of faith and our communities of faith. God, that we would be the kinds of people that would have our insides matching our outsides, that we would match our intentions, our good intentions, our best intentions, God, to be the people that you long for us to be, that we would match those with our actions and that our first steps would be in the right direction. God, we pray all of these things in the name of your son, Jesus Christ. Amen.